Welcome to episode 47 of Women Who Rebrand. It's time to listen up and learn for the wisdom of author, blogger and podcaster Harriet Shearsmith. Join me, Sarita, and my special guest this episode as we discuss emotional abuse, how to recognize it and how to heal from it. In Harriet's new podcast, Unfollowing Mum, she sheds light on her personal story of dealing with a narcissistic mother and the lasting effects it's had on her life. During this episode of Women Who Rebrand, hear why Harriet decided to share her story, what it was like growing up with a narcissistic mother, parental alienation, and how her experiences impacted her as an adult. Plus, get some advice about how to place boundaries, move on for your narcissistic parent, heal, and more. If you're tuning into this episode because you're dealing with the issues or topic we're discussing, it might be worth taking some notes. You can also visit www.digital.com to read more about Harriet, narcissistic abuse and support. You'll find all the information in this episode's show notes. Again, if you've been affected by the topic we're about to discuss, take it slow and be kind to yourself. And welcome, Harriet. Thank you so much for joining me. Um, Although it's a... I guess a very serious topic. Um, we've discussed narcissistic behavior and narcissists on the podcast before, but this is, um, I guess, delving deeper into the different types of narcissistic relationships that occur. So thank you so much for joining us. I'm oh, welcome. thank you for having me. Hello, everyone. Could you just tell us a bit about your podcast? You, I know you've um, been doing mumming it before. Yeah. Um, has that come to an end or is that a pause? Okay. Yeah, it's come to an end. I think um, Mum and It, I loved doing that and it, it relates back to a lot of the parenting stuff that I do on the channel. But that as a podcast has come to an end and I now have my relatively new podcast, which is Unfollowing Mum. And it's all about narcissistic um, parents, toxic family dynamics, uh, estrangement in particular, because what I found was... There was a lot of podcasts out there that addressed perhaps cycle breaking parenting or would touch on childhood trauma or would be specifically about childhood trauma. But there wasn't really anything out there that was specifically about estrangement and speaking to everyday people who have experienced estrangement from a parent or who have experienced traumatic childhood experiences and want to talk about it and create a safe space for them. So it's navigating all of that in a digital world, because I think now more so than ever before it's really difficult to create that space of peace it's really difficult to it's I mean you might think oh you could just block somebody but then how do you block everything it's really hard in a digital age to be fully estranged yeah and I have spoken to people like in the DMs and stuff and we've shared things on um Instagram um to accompany the narcissistic um, abuse kind of episodes and it is such a hard topic and I think for me when I was doing a lot of research there's lots of there, there is a few books on there and there's podcasts but there's not really many people that actually speak about it so there's I think there's less understanding about narcissistic abuse and narcissistic behavior and toxic families um in general so it's it's hard to I think it's hard to speak to friends about it number one because you're like well yeah when I was a teenager you know I hated my mum and my mum was a b-word and whatever 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 but it, it's just so much more than that so I'm glad that people are having these discussions you've got your podcast and just making things more um aware putting the information out there so people know that they're not alone because I think that's that's probably one of the hardest things if you think that you're the only one doing this so there's less of a way to understand it right yeah and I think the thing is when we make something really taboo we kind of cover it in a shroud of shame and that's when we internalize a lot of those feelings when we feel and I think as humans we are quite self-centered perhaps that's the wrong term but we we always think unless we can see other people doing it unless we can see it we can hear it being spoken about we must be the only ones right we must be the only ones going through it and you're never the only one no matter what your experience is no experience is entirely unique to someone it might be unique in in the way that it's affecting you 
but other people will have had the experience with narcissistic families. Other people will have had the experience with toxic parents. Other people will be estranged. But when we don't talk about these things and we don't share the experiences or we make it a topic that is, oh, you shouldn't talk about that. You shouldn't, you shouldn't speak ill of your family. Keep it in the family. That's when mm. we really cover it in this shroud of shame and create a stigma around it, which just makes it so much more difficult to heal from. Yeah, absolutely. But not only that, um, it's that whole thing of airing your dirty laundry. But I think that's also goes into the whole kind of narcissistic personality trait in terms of, you know, there is guilt there. There's that guilt of, oh, you're speaking ill of your family, et cetera, et cetera. But I think a lot of people can play on that because you're not going to explain what's happening. And therefore, they're just gonna well not necessarily just get away with it I don't want to use that term but no one's going to hold them accountable no one's going to you know be like that's not how you should treat your family that's not how you know that's not a love language essentially yeah so yeah that's another reason why people I think should just continue to share their stories if they can um again it's difficult and when it comes to toxic families, we're not just dealing with one person. That's a whole <laughs> lot of people, If especially if you have a big family, even if it is just two parents, that's just, you know, a lot of energy that you have mm. to deal with. It a is. Lot. And I think the, the phrase, don't speak ill of your family or that you shouldn't air your dirty laundry, these are the kind of phrases that actually actually keep abusers abusing because we tell the victim or we tell and I, the, the the word victim always makes me really uncomfortable but that's exactly what it is you are a victim of abuse when you are yeah. raised in a when raised by a narcissistic parent and it makes you uncomfortable because you've been given the message that you deserved that you've been given the message that that was normal you've been given the message that that was your parents way of acting and loving you and that you're just ungrateful and if you speak out about that then you're ungrateful or you have created it all in your mind which is just a form of gaslighting so when we say to people you shouldn't a dirty laundry it is a form of gaslighting and it is what keeps abusers abusing no matter what that abuse might look like whether it is emotional abuse physical abuse or sexual abuse it's it all adds together to say you've got to be quiet about this when actually you don't at all Absolutely. So what made you decide to share your story about having a um, narcissistic mother? For me, I'd gone through the experience of cutting contact with my mum. My mum actually lived with us at the time and I had to go through the experience of, yeah, asking her to leave our annex. And it was the one of the most traumatic experiences of my life and at the time there was a lot going on at home for me it was in the middle of the pandemic and I just felt so alone I really did feel so alone and I was alone and I didn't feel like I had anyone who understood how I felt what I was going through the grief of it the complicated emotions around it and I got myself into therapy which I was really lucky to be able to do And I started speaking to my therapist and finding that speaking about these things really helped. And one of the things that I have always done is used online platforms to find a sense of community. And I started thinking, okay, where is the community for this? Where Mm. is the community for adult children who have cut ties, who have become estranged? Why is there nothing out there? Why does nobody talk about this? Can't be the only one. And I started putting little bits out there. And the response was both heartbreakingly huge and heartwarmingly huge. (laughs) So many people reached out and said, oh, my God, me too. Or, oh, my God, this is my experience. Um, I've never heard anybody speak about this before, but this has happened to me. And the more people that reached out and would say to me, please don't stop talking about this because I've never seen anybody talk about it, the more I felt empowered to share my experience and to say, okay, you're not on your own in this. I'm not on my own in this either. And there is healing in community. There is so much to be said for community therapy. 
and for community healing. And I think that for me, once I started down that path, it, it made sense to keep talking about it, to keep sharing it. And I was also getting lots of people saying to me, I haven't seen your mum for a while on your, your Instagram. Is she not oh. in the annex anymore? And I was like, no. <laughs> oh. this, is, this is a bit of an awkward DM, but no, she doesn't live with us anymore. In fact, we don't talk. So <laughs> it kind of made a, it kind of naturally fell into place, really. Was that, see, I... That's, I guess that's the reason why I was started um, Instagram. It's like finding your community. I, I moved to um, a new area, didn't know anyone, had three children, just had my youngest. And I'm like twiddling my thumbs. I don't know what to do. I don't know any of these types of people. It's very different to London. Let's go online and make some friends. So that's, I love that side of social media and just curating your feeds to make it suit you and see what you want, but also grow um a community um that share your interests love what they see about you you it's almost like extended friends friends on the internet I don't necessarily refer to people that follow me quote unquote um doing air quotes there for people that are listening um mm -hmm. as followers it is a community and I just love the the reach as well. I can be sitting here in Essex all alone, but then I'm like, right, I'll go on social media and I'll be talking to someone in America or Brazil mm -hmm. or somewhere. So I love that. But um, I think for me, when I started and I look back now, I'm like, oh, I wish I didn't share everything. Like looking back now, I'm like, okay, people know my kids' names. Um, they know about my husband and stuff. And there's been instances where I'm like, haven't shared my husband for whatever reason, like you were saying about your mum. And I've had DMs like, oh, I hope everything's okay. And sometimes <laughs> that's from strangers that I didn't even know were following me. It didn't even like know them. I'm like, oh, that, that feels really weird. And I'm Invasive. Like, yeah. yeah. But at the same time, I kind of understand because I have put that out there. And I'm like, God forbid, if we did ever separate, am I going to have to be one of those, again, with the air quotes, like influencery people or people that has to do a statement? I'm like, ah, I, I wouldn't know. That'd be so, I don't know, just odd, peculiar for me. But um, I guess, how did you feel about once having or sharing that part of um, your life and that person on your social media? And then people realizing, oh, okay, she's she's not on there. Maybe something has happened. Did you feel that you had to make a statement about that? In a way, um, no, I don't think I did. I think for me, I was quite happy to sort of say to people in the DMs, oh, actually, no, mum doesn't live with us anymore. Or mm. to sort of briefly say, we're now doing this with the annex. And that's that. Without okay. having to feel like I had to make a big statement. Okay. Um, it felt like a natural progression. I think it certainly would have raised some eyebrows, but what it did do was highlight quite how much you can become enmeshed with a parent and quite yeah. how much a toxic parent can take over your life. You know, if you'd have asked me 10 years ago and people will have seen this online, I was talking about my mum being amazing, best friends, how we did everything together, how she was so supportive. Wow. Actually, that really wasn't reality. And looking back at it now, there are so many things that I know I've either shared with friends or that have shared online that are massive red flags knowing what I know now. Mm. But at the time, I framed them as this amazing, wonderful thing because in my mind, that's that's how I viewed them. And that's how I viewed so much of my relationship with my mother was that we had this amazing, close relationship when in reality, it wasn't an amazing close relationship. It was complete enmeshment and I had a total lack of identity of my own. Gosh. Do you think there was an element of trying to convince yourself that there was something there as well within that relationship? Yeah, there was. And I've been back and forth in therapy with my therapist over this. And if you listen to anything about narcissistic parents, especially when there's been a separation, my dad left when I was very young. I was just four. I did not have a good relationship with him. There was a lot of alienation from my mum's side, which mm -hmm. I can now say as an adult looking back, there was a lot of, you know, I mean, I was listening to full rundowns of the court transcripts from the age of about six through their divorce proceedings. So there was nothing that I didn't know. Wow. And there was a lot of 
toxicity there from my mum, but also a real abandonment from my dad. And he very much was disinterested. You know, I remember a dad who didn't turn up to birthday parties, that kind of thing. So when I look back, there is little me who essentially has one parent who is a narcissist who either I'm on her side and I'm with her, I'm her standing spouse, standing therapist, standing friend, and I have to support her or I have absolutely nobody. And that's one of the things that's so, so insidious, I guess, about a Mm. narcissistic parent. Because when you have a parent who is your caregiver, it's, it's built into us. It's a part of our evolution, a part of our being as a child to need that relationship with our caregiver. We need it. We have to have it. So as a child, we internalize so much because the idea that our caregiver can't provide for us, the idea that our caregiver is actually very damaging, is far too frightening for a child to accept. So what you have is a child who grows up convincing themselves that this is a great relationship, convincing themselves that that person is not flawed, that they're the one that's flawed internalizing all of it so that they can have this relationship because the alternative is just too scary and then we get to adolescence and we start to challenge these things and we're taught that that's not that's not going to fly that's not going to be acceptable you're ungrateful and you become the scapegoated person and again that's really frightening for anyone oh my gosh it's so intricate as Mm. well but also that fear of abandonment like you said you your your father wasn't around but then it's like well what's the alternative because if the alternative is like letting go then it's just like well where are my parents who are my parents and I guess you so like like me my 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 um parents split up when I was very young um and it was like father's day I would go above and beyond and be like oh I'll make a call to my mum yeah yeah I did <laughs> Happy, yeah, yeah. Happy Father's Day because I'm appreciative yeah. that you're doing both roles. And I'm really yeah. grateful. Um, oof, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. I, I, I felt that. I felt that. Do you, um, do you ever feel concerned about the potential repercussions of sharing, um, your story about your relationship with your mother online on your social media posts? I, I th- I've considered this question. Uh, many a time and actually no I think Mm. I there have been uh, the odd repercussions of talking about what I I talk about online Um, but ultimately no because I'm not sharing anything that isn't my truth and I've also always been very careful to say I believe my mum is a narcissist Mm -hmm, she fits mm -hmm. all of the narcissistic traits um, that I have researched and learned about but I am not qualified to diagnose and I never would and I'm always very cautious to say that and to make that distinction that I'm not diagnosing her as a narcissist but equally I can look back on my experience and you don't need to be a zoologist to identify a tiger (laughs) (laughs) you don't need to be a zoologist to identify a tiger you do not need to be a therapist a psychologist a professional to say what I experienced was abuse and it was narcissistic abuse and that was unacceptable you are an expert in your own lived experience. And for me, I'm very cautious not to name names and to mm-hmm. keep that barrier there. I think that's really important. So no, I don't fear the the repercussions of it. I'm also very open. Um, and people know that I'm very open about that. I talk about it from my point of view. So I think for me, there isn't that fear there that I've, I'm going to face repercussions because I haven't done anything wrong. I've spoken about my own experiences. Everything I've spoken about is true and is fair and accurate. And I haven't tried to step out of speaking about my experience from my point of view. Hmm. Mm. And I know it can be controversial. I know I had contact from my dad's adopted daughter at the beginning of this year, who was very angry because I'd shared my thoughts and feelings on him and his behavior and her mother's behavior online. And and she was really angry because she felt very much that things I'd said weren't true. She wasn't born for it. And it's very Mm. much the, um, 
the child who has a, has had a different experience of the same people. So we never get the same experience of our parents. So if you have siblings who are like, well, that wasn't my childhood, then no, it probably wasn't because you never get the same experience. You also never fit into the same role with a narcissistic parent or with a toxic parent. So her experience was very different to mine and that didn't invalidate my experience and my experience didn't invalidate hers. Um, but she felt very much that I shouldn't speak ill of her father because he had passed away and it was unfair. He couldn't defend himself. And whilst I could see her point of view, she had him for three years. I survived him for 16. So I mm. recall both. I, I, I recall both my parents and their behaviours and can speak on those. Yeah, it's interesting that you you touched upon the fact that, you know, people do have different experiences with everyone, no matter Mm -hmm. what their personalities are, et cetera, et cetera. And with um, the traits of narcissistic people, although their traits may present in different relationships and different areas of their lives, they are always going to act differently with different people because, again, everyone's human and you know, one good story might be a completely different story in someone else's eyes. So I'm glad to hear that that encounter didn't kind of invalidate your, your feelings, because it it must be difficult to be so open and share your story and finally acknowledge and accept your truth, but then be, um, not invalidated, but someone tell you you're wrong because I'm assuming you're you've already battled with this this um oh yeah this this thoughts and everything and obviously I'm assuming you've tried to reason or rationalize and you know look to yourself as you said you kind of internalize things and perhaps you think well that was my fault but I'm assuming you've worked so hard to you know realize that no this is my truth this is my truth yeah. Oh, no, I've gone back and forth and I must have made it all up. I must have made it all up. And especially knowing what I know now about my relationship with my mother and knowing that there was an awful lot of alienation, which is completely different to estrangement. There was a lot of her really, and I hate the phrase, turning me against my dad. Like little air quotes there for anybody who's listening. I hate that phrase because it wasn't so much turning me against my dad. I it just doesn't feel like that fully describes what happens it was constant associations that would be negative towards my father it would be constant reminders of all the things that my dad had done that were wrong and then my dad's behavior amplified amplified that and knowing now that there was so much alienation that went on it's really easy to hear his adopted daughter saying but he wasn't that person you didn't know him that's not fair and me think oh maybe I was wrong maybe I did Mm. maybe I did imagine him not turning up at birthday parties maybe I did imagine the time that he slammed the phone down on me because I said I liked mum's boyfriend maybe I did imagine all these things and I didn't And I didn't imagine the abusive behavior from my mum any more than I imagined the neglect from my dad. But it's so easy to self-gaslight because you're raised with that inner critic. You're raised with that self-gaslighting voice that says to you, you're the one in the wrong, because that's our biology. That's, That's how we work. To believe that the parent is the one in the wrong as a small child is unfathomable. So we we are raised with this self-gaslighting behavior. And I think somebody had said to me, she's a a psychotherapist who specializes in narcissism. Her name's Helen Villers, and she does Insight Pod. And she'd said to me, and she does it with uh, Katie McKenna, who's also a psychotherapist. And they were talking on my podcast about uh, narcissistic parents and the narcissistic experience. And they'd said, you know, it's self-gaslighting if you would feel angry or upset if someone else said it to you. If you feel that it would be unjust, unfair, it is self-gaslighting. If you're saying it to yourself, but somebody else said it to you and you thought, what? That's not, that's not true. How dare you? Or you felt, oh, that's upset me. Then it's self-gaslighting. Oh, wow. Yeah, I love Ellen's podcast and I love her mm. Instagram. It's been so insightful. Yeah. Um, 
you you mentioned alienation and that is something that I've wanted to speak about um, for the longest time. Um, and I guess that's another topic that's that's hard to discuss. The whole concept of parental alienation. So many people go through this concept, but again, so many people don't understand it or um, even acknowledge it. It's like, you know, you may discuss, you know, everyone has difficult partners or can have difficult exes. But the the parental alienation and the manipulation that goes within that is so, so, um, so much. And like you said, you heard court transcripts and obviously there's the oversharing and your mother obviously had her relationship. And again, things happen in relationships, but there should be that boundary not all kids need no no kid needs to hear about the intricacies or the things that went wrong in your relationships because your relationship has nothing to do with the child's relationship and growing up that must be so difficult to to cope with because as you said you know you look to your parent as the the truth speaker the one that teaches you about life because that is their role and everything they say, you know, is is gospel. It's like my child will ask me the most randomest questions, like, "How does? Why is the moon this color?" And da, da, da. I'm like, "Do you know what? I have no idea. I don't know. <laughs> Google is your friend. I don't know everything. I, I can't know everything because I'm human." But yeah, I would love to discuss parental alienation because I've I'm aware and I know people that have um, they're adults. And they went through parental alienation and don't speak to their other parent or parents that have children who are completely alienated. And that form of, I'm going to call it what it is, it is abuse because it's manipulation and the years that the child is going through their formative years, they're learning how to have a relationship with that parent. And if all they're hearing is the negativity, obviously they're going to grow up thinking negatively of that parent, which is so unfair because, again, that is not allowing the child to experience a family because it's not just one person. It's the whole paternal side or the whole maternal side. And for me, I just agree that, you know, you do need a community to raise children it'd be the most amazing thing if I could live in my community with my Instagram community yeah (laughs) Um, and obviously it's good if they're all positive influences but it must be hard because you're then put in that position where you feel like you have to choose like you know and not only are you believing all of these things but if there is a part of you that did want to have that relationship you're then displeasing or going against what your main parent wants, needs, and has said. They've actively said it, not necessarily said, do not have a um, relationship with them. But you know it's going to upset them, which is so controlling, so controlling. It is, and it's a really difficult situation for anyone to navigate. I think even even as adults, when our parents separate, and I speak to people whose parents have separated when they've become adults, and it's a bit of a push and a pull, and a, well, why are you going over there to see your dad, and why are you doing... That's toxic as it is, but when you're a small child, it's really difficult. And the one problem, I think, when we talk about parental alienation is it's so often, and it's the lack of understanding around both, but it's so often confused with estrangement and they really are Mm. totally different things so I will have people say to me oh well you're you're alienating your children and it's it's no we're estranged from my mum my mum doesn't have contact with them because of her behavior that's a completely different thing when it came to my dad's behavior that wasn't great either I mean I'm sure my mum would have argued that there were a lot of things that she did because I had a right to know and 
there's this concept that children have a right to know above and beyond what is necessary. There were a lot, there is, it's great to have open, honest communication with your children, but bad mouthing falls out of that category. Giving them all of the information falls out of that category. And we even had a nickname for my stepmom who was not a very nice woman. I had three adults in my life and not one of them really did right oh, by anything. Um, and looking back on them all, they were incredibly toxic, damaged people who there was a little girl in the middle of it all who really suffered for it. And that wasn't fair. And that wasn't OK. And they all had their own demons to battle. But that, that doesn't make it acceptable. But there is a really valuable conversation around parental alienation in the same way that there's a really valuable conversation around parental estrangement but they aren't the same. And so many people do confuse them as the same. One essentially is the manipulation of the child or person, because it can happen with uh, with adults as well, to convince them to pull away from another person. Mm. One is a choice made to become no contact. Mm. Very two separate things. Yeah. At www.digital.com, you'll find the Women Who Rebrand podcast and bonus content to accompany each episode. Plus, between episodes and season breaks, you'll get access to informative articles and personal stories about health and wellness, relationships and careers. Take a journey with us to become your most authentic self because you matter. Join our online community on Instagram and TikTok at www.digital. You said that, which was heartbreaking, and it's something that should not have happened because every child, every person just deserves to just live and grow up in in loving families. Um, what kind of lasting impact did that have on you as an adult? I mean, you, you hear the joke of my whole personality is a trauma response across TikTok all the time. Um, well, because that is me. <laughs> that, that literally is me. My whole personality is a trauma response. I've had to unlearn so much um, trauma. Yeah, it is. It's trauma. I've had to work through CPTSD, mm-hmm. which is complex post-traumatic stress disorder and work through a lot of the issues that come with that a massive lack of self-worth the lack of self-identity um so many things that I have had to work really hard on so many people pleasing tendencies a complete lack of boundaries and inability to set them to get to the point now where actually all of these things that I do now where I set boundaries where I make time for myself where I value myself and I believe that I am lovable or I'm working towards it and I feel that I am an individual on my own are quite foreign to me and I'm in my early 30s these are things that we develop in adolescence Mm. so for me it's had a massive impact on who I am as a person it's also made me really funny (laughs) (laughs) The dark humour is popping. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. But it's been really, it, it, it's been really enlightening and empowering to work on myself and to address and acknowledge the trauma that I've had. And it is trauma. I think we quite often will talk about things and people see trauma as a bit of a push word now, but it's not. Trauma is a real thing. It's something that we all carry with us. And even in healthy dynamics, we we will have trauma from our childhood, we'll have wounds that we need to address. But when you have grown up with so much toxicity and you've grown up with a narcissistic parent or a toxic parent as your caregiver and your primary caregiver and one who is ambivalent at best, it is incredibly difficult to grow into an adult who knows themselves, who trusts themselves, who isn't hyper independent. Like I don't even like I don't even like asking if you can reach a bag for me. I'm like, I'll do it, I'll climb. <laughs> yeah, I, I feel you there. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah. I'm like, I will just climb on this counter, thank you very much. And my husband stood there like, I'm an extra foot taller than you. What do you want? Like, just ask me to pass it down. No, I could do it. <laughs> so and that's obviously the lighter side of it. It's poking fun at it a bit. 
because I can because I think sometimes if you don't you will just cry or you will just wither away and I'm not going to do that I refuse to do that and I've been lucky enough to work through a lot of things in therapy and come to a point where I feel like I am my more authentic self I feel like I finally stepped into that role amazing I've heard so many times um, within these kind of dynamics that you, a lot of children have grown up to be very independent and very mature. And looking back as yourself as a child, you were probably seen as quite um, independent and mature. Um, where was I going with that? I got oh, I lost on <laughs> a tangent. Oh, I was going to say, was that one of the things that you were praised for growing up, being mature and being independent? Yeah, massively. I, so from the age of four, I very rarely had any peers as friends. I was always, oh, you don't really get on with your peers. You get on with all the adults. And I would sit with my mum and the other adults, listening to their conversations, chatting with them, joining in. Um, I didn't really have any friends of my own. I was just an extension of that and always so mature you're far too grown up for your age you're so wise for your age and I was none of those things I was a parentified child <laughs> mm, and some just, kids are some kids yeah. are just mature some yeah. kids do yeah. naturally get on with a wide spectrum of people and there is nothing wrong with that so if you're listening and you're like oh shit my child gets on really well with everybody oh that's not what I'm saying at all but for me I I didn't really have those opportunities because I was my mum's therapist. I was my mum's stand-in spouse. Wow. That must have been so difficult. So when you were a child, um, do you do you have siblings? Do you mind? Do you no, just, I don't uh, have siblings. So I was an only child. child. Mm-hmm. <sighs> so as an only child, I know what that's like. Um I think I had a lot of me time, but I, I, I was lucky enough to, um, I had friends, but I guess the only time I did get to socialize was at school. So that was why I loved primary school and loved going to friends and like friends were like the most amazing things ever. Cause that was the only time I think that I could truly be myself outside of, um, my household. So it's interesting to hear that you were saying, you know, you were, basically an extension of your mother the the caregiver um the one that sat within adult conversations at home and probably hearing things that you know that age group shouldn't hear because they're just having frank conversations around you oh, yeah it it was and it's funny that you say that you really loved school and that you felt like you could be yourself there because i had quite mm. the opposite i was and mm. it's some it's really weird to try and understand it i mean i've struggled to try and understand it but looking back at my childhood and my therapist would say it's that fear of abandonment showing itself in different ways but i used mm. to hate to go to school and the anxiety that i would have sometimes around going to school would be so huge because and, and again, she would say subconsciously it links to that fear of abandonment, to yeah. that if you're not with your mum, what are you meant to be doing? And and that was really difficult for me. And I did, as I came into secondary school, I did have a form of, of little, you know, a group of friends mm-hmm. um, that I could get on with. But especially when I was in primary school and I was much younger, I really struggled to make friends. I really struggled to socialise with my own peer group. Yeah. Well, that's no surprise, really, because if you've got no siblings around you, if there are no like cousins or anything like that around your age group, when are you learning to socialise with your peer group? And that can be difficult for people um, who are only children, who don't grow around kids, who are always with that one parent, like people your age can kind of be a bit alien to you like what do you talk about what are this common interests you wouldn't know because you are sitting around adults and perhaps you wouldn't even necessarily get them really mm. yeah absolutely um it was a complete challenge I think to really relate to peers mm. and mm. I wasn't by any um 
by any stretch of the imagination sort of sat alone all of the time yeah. uh, when I was at school and that kind of thing I would get on with friends but I definitely found it difficult to relate to them and I remember a lot when I was growing up people would say oh, you come out with such grown-up things and then it would almost be a bit of a surprise if I did act my age right because oh. I was such a grown-up I was such a mini grown-up an old soul um and when I did act my age it would be like well actually that's developmentally normal yeah. but that's so out of character for her it's like well no it's just it's just normal it's just yeah. a normality peeking through uh, were you ever um did you ever get in trouble or anything like that if you did kind of act your age or yourself at home yeah, I did. And yeah. I, yeah. And it, it could be a mixture of things. Quite often what I would experience would be my mum would blow up with this rage. And anybody who's experienced uh, narcissism will know of narcissistic rage explosions. And then five minutes later, it would be as if nothing had ever happened. And that was such an odd experience. And so disorientating for a child and it is incredibly common with narcissistic parents to behave that way and it is incredibly common for children who've experienced that to really struggle because it's so disorientating one minute you've got someone screaming and shouting at you who stormed off and the next minute they're acting as if nothing ever happened I mean what's going on wow. that's a really bizarre experience to deal with and that was very very common when I was younger and then on the odd occasion I would do something that would really upset my mum and she would bring in the silent treatment and the silent treatment is a form of abuse it is so damaging and we see a lot on social media people joking about oh, she's not talking to me she's just fine fine and that kind of thing and actually really it's a, it's a really damaging thing to do in your relationships be they parent to child friend to friend spouse to spouse whatever it can be really toxic and damaging the silent treatment has such a huge impact and what that's meant for me as an adult is that if I do have a disagreement with my spouse there's almost that are you coming back like the form response mm. where I'm trying to people please and I've had to work really hard to step out of that yeah and I was going to say in terms of you growing up in that environment, you know, you're going to naturally want to avoid confrontation, upsetting people, constantly stepping on eggshells because you don't know where it's going to go because you don't want to get that response. And I'm assuming that maybe have presented in relationships in your in your um, adult life, like just, again, people pleasing, always wanting to make sure that everyone else is OK so you don't get that form of treatment. So in a way, the people pleasing aspect was a way to protect yourself. Yeah, absolutely. And it is a protection. It's a way of saying, oh, you know, if everybody else's needs are met, then mine don't matter. And that's okay. Mm. And it's accepting that. And again, it goes back to that lack of boundaries. So it's very difficult to stop being a people pleaser to work your way out of that that and to set boundaries and to sometimes put yourself first there is nothing wrong with putting yourself first sometimes mm. but when you are a child of a toxic parent it's really difficult to learn how to put yourself first because you've been brought up always catering to their needs before you've even considered your own mm. absolutely because where do you even start if that must just feel so foreign like the concept is non-existent so how did you when did you actually start to place boundaries with with your toxic family um I don't think I ever really quite got the hang of placing boundaries with like small my steps. yeah I'm, I think it was more when we went no contact that was the beginning of really putting boundaries in so yeah. My when my mum had lived with us, we'd built the annex because that was what I felt was being a loyal daughter, was doing the right thing right. and looking after her as she'd looked after me, which you don't owe your parents that. And that was very much what I was brought up with, that attitude that I owed that to my parent to do that. You don't at all. <laughs> and that's actually very unhealthy to put that on your children. Yeah. But I was was brought up with that attitude and I thought I was being the good and the loyal daughter and our relationship after mum moved out of the main house into the annex just became 
more and more and more toxic more and more aggressive towards each other she'd come over and she'd call me a bitch in front of the children and that kind of thing and every night she would come over for dinner because one of the agreements of her living in the annex was that I would cook her dinner every night Mm. (laughs) so there's a, a great example of a complete lack of boundary if we were out or we wanted to do anything it had to kind of be pre-planned and explained and then I'd get phone calls asking where I was and why I wasn't home in my 30s and all of these things that she felt so entitled to own me and I never really put my foot down with them and then when I did and I'd said to her this really isn't working I think the best thing for you to do is to move out we will set you up so that you have your own house you've not any way out of pocket or struggling or anything you know you you will have all of the things that you would have had if you'd sold your house to a complete stranger and we'll just get you set up and then we'll be able to see each other and do all of these things and it was no because she would rather lose the relationship than lose control of her daughter that's what it boiled down to so then there was almost like this moment of of clarity of ah okay that's how this is going to go so this isn't about me this is about having ownership and control of me okay right and then that was when it was you will not speak to me you will not come over to the house you will not do this if you do I'll just walk away Uh, you won't be able to access me And that was when the boundaries started to come in. So it was almost all like a big break all at once. Mm, And that must be so difficult as well, because I've read into all of this before. And it's like, you know, if you've got a narcissistic parent or toxic family, take small steps, put in small boundaries first. So, you know, ease yourself into it because it's a it must be completely a complete shock to the system to completely go against everything you know and have the power and the confidence within to actually stand up and say no when you've never done it before Mm -hmm. so although I'm assuming you kind of obviously because you've got that fear of abandonment there is that um knowledge that you know you're you're actually conquering a fear or you're going through the possible fear of being abandoned and it just must have been so difficult it was and I think I'd started to from from when I was a teenager um I'd started to for well probably early 20s more likely because when I was a teenager and and early 20s I was very much like a parrot of my mum if she said we vote this way we would vote that way if she said we believe this we believe that and it's more when I became a parent myself that I started to form my own opinions and Mm. then I would challenge hers or I would start to say to her at the dinner table don't say that around the kids mum I don't like it don't do that and Mm. every time it would result in an argument every time it would result in oh I guess I'm just the most awful mother ever and all of the very classic narcissistic parent things that you will hear Mm -hmm. and every time it would cause some kind of problem but there were small things that I would put into place but it was that big break that really made a big difference for me. What was it like trying to explain to your children about going non-contact because um you know they're in the house with you did they have positive relationships with her or how, how, what was that it, like it was really difficult so when we'd asked my mum to leave and I'd said look you, you really are gonna have to leave she'd called one of the kids over to come and look at right move with her and said mummy's making me leave the house <laughs> so at that point it was a case of ah right you're not gonna do this how it should be done you're going to try and involve the kids and I'm not going to allow you to do that so you will not have access to them and we had to sit them down and say to them look we're not going to be going over to the annex anymore we're not going to be spending time with Momo because she's behaving this way mm-hmm. and then there were there were conversations around are we ever going to spend time with her and I'd say well I'd like to think so but at this point in time I'm not sure because mm-hmm. it's very up in the air if that does become a possibility if her behavior becomes okay to be around then I'd hope so but I'm not Mm. sure and then it very quickly became apparent that no that wasn't going to work 
And then surprisingly, my eldest probably had the closest relationship with her. And then we very much discovered that it wasn't a close relationship. It was a very similar relationship to what I had as a child with her. There were so many things that he came out with that he would say, I didn't ever say anything, but more, more, which is what they called her, would tell me that, you know, mummy's not a nice person or daddy's not the right man for mummy or that I must not tell them about this or that I should do this. And there'd been occasions when, I know on one occasion, she'd looked after the kids when myself and my husband were away for a day and she'd not sent him to school because she thought they could have some me and him time. And she did that a lot with me when I was younger. I wouldn't be made to go to school if I didn't want to, which is sounds great if you're a child and you're like <laughs> woo, day off but when you look back and yeah. you had 20 percent attendance during your final years at school purely based on the fact that you didn't want to go and didn't like it and your parent couldn't be bothered to make you that's a big red flag and there were so many little things that then came forwards mm. and that started to be revealed by my eldest that actually it was almost like it was a relief for him and it was almost like it was a relief for all of them. And we're very conscious, or I'm I'm very, very conscious to not bad mouth in front of them. I will say to them, that behavior wasn't acceptable. And that's why we don't see her. But that's not because we're being unkind or because we're being cruel. But you can't behave that way towards children. You can't manipulate children. You can't encourage them to lie. You can't do these things. That's not acceptable. And that's why we don't see her. And if they have any, you know, I could quite easily turn around and be rage and, oh, she's a bitch, she does this, she's awful. I'm not going to do that because it's just unhealthy for them. It's explaining to them in an age-appropriate way, okay, do you remember this situation? Well, that was really unkind and really unacceptable. And we don't allow people to treat us that way just because they're family. And they would be like, oh. Okay. And I remember on one occasion, they'd said, well, why did you ask her to leave? And I said, well, do you remember when this happened? And they'd say, yeah, I remember like she'd come over for dinner and she was really nasty to you. Yeah. Okay. Just because somebody is a blood relative or their family, or we love them very much, because I do, just because we have those feelings for them and we care for them does not mean that they are allowed to treat us that way. And that's the bottom line of it. They are not allowed to treat us that way. And if they can't respect when we've asked them not to treat us that way, then we need to make a change. We need to put boundaries in place to protect ourselves. And that's what we've done. And, you know, kids are not stupid. They accept that. And you can explain that to them without bad mouthing the other person, without being unkind about the other person with identifying the behaviours that cause you problems and with identifying where you've asked and set boundary and it's been ignored and disrespected and what the consequence of disrespecting that boundary is. Yeah. And just going back to what you were saying about, you know, having these conversations and then it coming out, you know, oh, she said this or she did this in the past. And I've heard that so many times with these relationships that, the the bad mouthing didn't start when you left it was that behavior years ago and then when you finally do go no contact I've heard so many stories of you know oh she used to say this about you and then that kind of it's like them trying to make them view you in a certain way to kind of I guess um Make Victim it more difficult. Center. Yeah, but make it also more difficult for you to have real relationships with other people. Basically manipulating their version of you when you've got no contact that causes more problems with people that you know, like um, other family members, because they have this preconceived notion or already manipulated thoughts and opinions of you so it's hard to actually form their own judgment in that in that um 
occurrence. Does that make sense? I think I'm going on a tangent. There's so many things I'm trying to form into one sentence. No, it does. It makes sense. It does. <laughs> it's that isolation. And narcissists will quite yeah. often isolate you. And I look back at my relationships with friends, close friends, with um, partners, and almost all of them ended because of either the way that my mum would talk to me about them Mm. or because of the way my mum would talk to them or because the way of my mum would insert herself in our relationship and yeah I can absolutely see a pattern now when I look back of those behaviors but I couldn't see it at the time and that's the problem with abuse you can't see it at the time but it's incredibly common for narcissists to be bad mouthing you to be um even if they think of you as their golden child their their wonderful one there's so so many things that you discover after you've become no contact with a narcissist and especially a narcissistic parent or a toxic parent who has been saying all sorts of things you know my mum would say all sorts of things that I've learned since then um I remember my mother-in-law saying to me she told her that she wished that I'd died instead of the triplets that she had beforehand because that would have been better and yeah all sorts of things that I would just steal from her that I was an evil evil person she didn't know where she'd gone wrong and these are all ways in which they manipulate other people's perceptions of you and keep you isolated because isolation means you're controlled yeah yeah and again playing on that whole fear of abandonment because that didn't come from nowhere obviously that was within her parenting style obviously to keep you closer to keep Mm -hmm. hold of you to have that control and if you've got no other support systems you're just gonna cling on to it and I I just see so many people clinging on to relationships that are so toxic just because they're fearful of what's on the other side what does life look like without them I'm not going to be anything without that person because you're you're groomed and you're taught to think that way you hear it so many times in relationships like ex is saying to me oh you know you're never going to meet anyone else um (laughs) up and it's like at the time you stupidly believe it and it's like looking back it's always easier to look back hindsight Oh my gosh, what was I thinking? Yeah, Why and the equivalent, was I in there for so long? Yeah, the equivalent of that with a mother, with a, a toxic mother, is no one will ever love you like I do. Oh. Mm. Yeah. I, yeah, I remember hearing that so much growing up. And it's it's often discussed when people are discussing narcissism and narcissistic parents or toxic parents and adults who go no contact is the emotional manipulation that is no one will ever love you as much as I do because that's so common to hear that it's so widely used and it's often used it with great intention as well in healthier relationships but for a narcissistic parent or a toxic parent no one will ever love you as much as I do sends the message that you are unlovable and I'm the only one that loves you I'm the one that you have to rely on because I'm the only one that you have. The relationship style that you had and the messages that you were getting, I assume that possibly you think that is love. Mm -hmm. It's love to be rageful. It's love to be insulting. This is normal. So then that opens up so many harmful avenues for adults who have been in these relationships when they're forming partnerships of their own because they're going into those partnerships thinking you know that's what love is so it's no when reading up on this there's been no surprises that a lot of adults who have had narcissistic parents then go into narcissistic relationships because that is what they know which from so many other problems because then it's like this continuation this continuation of these cycles It is. It's a continuation of the cycle. And then you begin to think to yourself, well, there must be something wrong with me then because not everybody can be a narcissist, surely. Not everybody can be the one in the wrong. It must be me. Mm -hmm. And it's not you. It's because you've been conditioned and taught to believe that that is what love looks like. So when you look for a potential partner, you find your parent (laughs) and they are not Mm -hmm. what love looks like. Gosh. Um, So you have done so much healing. You've done all of the um, 
the books I'm assuming yeah <laughs> and, <done> um, <laughs> therapy which is amazing like you know I am an advocate I love therapy I think therapy should be starting in primary schools giving someone just to talk to it's so important um but what's been the biggest lessons that you've learned through the process of your healing Oh, that's a big question. I think one of the biggest lessons that I've learned is that I am allowed to be an individual and that I am worthy of love, that I'm worthy of my own self-respect and that setting boundaries is not is not something that you are um, I'm trying to think of the word that when you're, you're when you're setting boundaries, that's not selfish. That's it. Setting boundaries is not selfish. Setting boundaries is something that everybody should be doing, that we should all be encouraged to do. That is perfectly healthy. Setting a boundary isn't trying to control someone else's behavior or control someone else's emotions, control someone else's responses. It's saying, if you do this, I will not accept it. And I will do this. I'm not controlling whether you do topic A, that's up to you. But what I'm saying is I won't allow you to do it to me. So I'm going to walk away from that. And if you choose to do that, then that's on you. And that's that setting boundaries is so important and that it's not selfish and it's not a betrayal. And I think working through therapy and, and looking very closely at that sense of betrayal when you do speak out against a, a parent's behavior or you do speak out and you do cut contact with a parent or you do place those boundaries and if they choose to disrespect them you follow through on what you said you would do none of those things make me a bad person they make me a person and I'm allowed to be that I'm allowed to be a person in my own right absolutely I hope you're proud of yourself are you proud I'm of working yourself? on it I'm working oh! on it I work on it. I work. So it's a constant thing. And I think the thing is, you, we have this notion of healing and healed, that mm. we will eventually reach this sort of promised land of being healed. And I don't think we ever really do. I think we spend our lives healing and working through different like, different traumas, different experiences, because you're never at the same stage in life. So different things will bring up different triggers and you're gonna have to work through that. It's constantly growing. It's constantly evolving and learning as a person. And that doesn't ever really stop. So I am, I'm proud of myself for protecting my children. If I look at it, if I frame it that way, and I talked about this on the podcast, um, not so long ago that if I frame it as I'm proud of myself for telling my mum that she had to leave our annex in order to protect our children and to create a safer space for them then I can feel that pride but if I had to look at it just for protecting me then oof, it's much harder yeah it's harder because again you're going back to that thing of you know what was it um if if someone said it to okay so I can't remember you said, but in a roundabout way. Yeah, it's that self-gaslighting, isn't it? It's it's going back to that lack of self-worth. Yeah, because it's far more easier to hear something negative about yourself. But if someone said that negative thing to your children or someone you love, obviously, you'd be like, oh, it's coming on. How dare you? Yep, yep, yep. So, yeah, life life is a journey. And, you know, I'm, I'm totally with you in terms of healing and, you know, that process is never done. I always think, okay, I'm I'm um, always thinking dark thoughts. I'm one of those ones that love dark comedy and stuff like that. But I also yeah. have visions of me like my last days in my elaborate gown on my deathbed. <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> I'm going to go out with a smile on my face because I'm like, you did it. You, you yeah. did that journey well. You broke those generational curses. Yes. And just pave the way for so much more. And that, I guess, is a legacy. You've broken the generational cycle because you've given your kids, your children, the tools to know how to navigate relationships, to get, navigate life and to place boundaries and to value respect and be respected. Yeah. Absolutely. 
Yeah, very much so. And I think, again, with generational trauma, it is, it's generational. So I've given them the tools to break the trauma that perhaps I was given. And then they will develop their own tools to break whatever trauma I give them. <laughs> whenever, whenever None of us are making it out of this thing without some level of mistake, yeah. because that's what human beings do. But it's also showing them that it's okay to make mistakes when you can hold yourself accountable. And you can repair and you can understand and you can listen and you can meet each other with empathy, compassion and kindness. And that's really important for me to instill in my children. And then hopefully they will go on and instill even more and better in their children and continue to break these generational cycles and these stigmas. There you go. There you go. They, they, they've learned what love looks like and then you know if you do ever have drunk children just think how amazing they're gonna be they're gonna be like no gran no grandma yeah. um nonna um yeah I do not want to do that but I still love you and it's okay yeah. and just imagine the power of that that just must be so incredible just to I'll be sat there like oh okay <laughs> Right. Well, I'm truly back in my place. It always, it knocks me for six every time my kids are like, uh, mummy, don't shout at me. That upsets me. And I'm like, oh, I've been Uno reversed. Oh, see, this is coming back to bite me. And, you know, they can vocalise their feelings. And I've had, yeah. I've spent a rough week with my tween who is very hormonal and, you know, very in his feelings and we'd had a big argument the other day about homework and then yesterday he was just really aggressive and I'd said to him I don't know what's wrong with you can you kind of sit can you come down a bit and meet me and like talk to me <laughs> he said to me how do you know so much about this stuff because I'd explained to him okay that frustration you're feeling is that's that's hormonal and that's okay if you feel there's nothing wrong but you don't know why you feel you need that big outlet of emotion that's okay it's okay to feel frustrated for no reason it's okay to be angry for no reason it's okay to be a bit hateful sometimes for no reason you can't quite put a word on it you are going through a lot of hormonal changes <laughs> he went how do you know so much about this stuff? I was like, because my guy, I have spent a lot of time and a lot of effort researching, understanding, studying. And then I have lived this experience. And I want you to understand that it's okay to have feelings and verbalize those feelings. It's not okay for you to be unkind to your brother and sister because you're, you're annoyed. Okay, there's the difference. And it's just... For us to be able to sit and talk about those things, those were things that I wouldn't have had when I was yeah. growing up, or the talking would have been very manipulative. Yeah. And I want them yeah. to realise that talking is power. Absolutely. And you've given them the space safe to do that and, you know, be comfortable. And no, it's it's your they've got an unconditional they've got unconditional love for their mum and you've yeah. got unconditional love for them there's no terms and conditions or hidden meanings or whatever whatever just you know it's just love someone that's been listening to this episode and they're like dang maybe or <laughs> you know <laughs> they feel that they need to step away from a toxic family or be like you know I am struggling with my life because I haven't put any boundaries in place because of narcissistic parents. What advice would you give to someone who is currently dealing with um, a toxic family or narcissistic parent and they do actually want to just, you know, make their decisions and live life on their own terms? The most important thing for me and the thing that I recommend to absolutely everybody is if it is accessible for you, therapy. Mm. Uh, but I realise that, that that comes with the caveat of if it is accessible to you. If it isn't accessible to you, then finding somebody that you can trust, that you can talk to, that you can have there to listen, to hear you, to say, to hold space for your feelings like as a therapist might, um, be that a friend, a spouse, anybody, Samaritans, somebody who you can speak to, who can talk to you, who can hear you out. That is a huge part of what has helped me get through and be where I am now. Therapy has been um, an essential part, I think, of my acceptance and my growth. And that I would recommend that to absolutely everybody. 
I think allowing yourself to realize that there is no guilt or shame in setting boundaries, in understanding that it's okay to say no, it's okay to say, I'm not going to do that, actually, that that doesn't fit with me as an adult, that's not my choice, and I'm not going to do that. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with being firm with a parent and saying no. There's nothing wrong with not agreeing to go around for Sunday dinner because that's what they've always expected you to do. All these small things, you are not a bad person if you're setting boundaries. Um, So therapy, accepting that you're not bad if you are setting boundaries. And if if possible, immersing yourself in, I, I find, and it's not the same for everybody, but personally, I found real power in education and in learning about the experience. So for me, I follow um, social media accounts of therapists who talk about narcissism. I follow self-help accounts. I read self-help books. If you are someone who is quite analytical and you are someone who absorbs the information and finds that it helps you to understand and rationalize, then that's been really powerful for me. And if you're not, then that's probably going to be a useful tip. (laughs) Probably going to be a useless tip. But um, if you are someone, then that, that would really help. But finding someone that you can trust, especially if that person is a professional, it is worth its weight in gold. Yeah. Thank you. Harriet, thank you so much. I mean, like I said, we spoke about narcissism before, but, you know, the intricacy of (sighs) narcissistic parents and toxic families. I could talk about this. Maybe I need to do a whole season on this, but (laughs) it's just so important to have these conversations. So thank you for sharing your story with us and your experiences with us. I'm sure we only touched the surface of everything, which is why, you know, I recommend you guys and ladies and everyone in between to um, listen to Harriet's podcast. And I'm going to put all the information in the write up to this episode, which will be available on www.digital.com um the links will be found in the show notes but I'll give some extra information on narcissism and link to previous podcasts and some articles about narcissistic abuse as well um Harriet where can our lovely audience find your line find your podcast well obviously they can find that on digital um, sorry find that on www.digital.com but <laughs> what about um your other work so your mumming book mumming it podcast um website instagram give us it all yep so you can find me i'm quite simple to be fair you can find me at toby and rue on tiktok and uh, instagram toby and is my website i do things like meal planning and tips for days out with your kids talking about all that kind of thing I also have an estrangement series on my YouTube, which is Harriet Shear Smith, and then I post weekly on there as well. And I also now have Unfollowing Mum at Unfollowing Mum on TikTok and on Instagram, where I share things that relate to estrangement, toxic families. So that is a community that is growing, that will hopefully offer a sense of support and um, community and community therapy and healing for people. Fun. Fantastic. And then I will my book, you can grab anywhere. <laughs> hey, my book is all... loving it. So excellent, excellent. I'm gonna be sure to put all those details and more um, within the write up. So again, thank you, Harriet, for joining me. This was just such an incredible um, episode. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. You're welcome. Right. Take care of yourself. Okay. I will. All right. I will. Thank you. You too. Bye. Bye. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Women Who Rebrand. Be sure to subscribe and leave a rating to keep up with upcoming episodes. Join our online community on Instagram and TikTok at WWR Digital. And stay tuned for our next episode featuring another fantastic guest ready to discuss the most insightful topics. Thanks for listening.